Welcome everyone. I've got a huge privilege here to speak to a longtime uh, colleague and friend, uh, Dragan Gasevich. He's uh, someone I first met when I was at Athabasca University probably about uh, 14 years ago. I think he was actually on the panel that hired me uh, into uh, my role in the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca. So, and then uh, a really close colleague that was critical in uh, helping work together to establish the field of uh, learning analytics. And so he's someone who I've worked with extensively and I've seen his development and growth uh, from as an academic and in terms of the tremendous research outputs that, that he's doing and probably the most cited and most in-demand researcher in the learning analytics field. So Dragon, really appreciate you taking the time for a quick chat. To get started, can you provide a quick introduction? Who are you, what do you do? Thanks very much, George. Privileged to be part of this conversation and really excited about your course and everything that you are doing. These days, I'm with Monash University. I'm a professor there and I'm directing the new Center for Learning Analytics. Uh, in the new center, we are trying to focus on the use of learning analytics for feedback and assessment, analytics for curriculum and employment, and uh, emerging themes in learning analytics related to um, um, primarily multimodal analytics and the space analytics, but we'll see for how long we are going to use the space analytics and rather we'll be focusing on online for a bit. Yeah, that's and, and it's important to note as well, you know, you have extensive expertise in the online environment. You've mentored and nurtured doctoral students online. You've taught uh, computer science and related courses online. You, you've uh, been involved in teaching uh, early uh, open online courses, now commonly called MOOCs online uh, as well. So you have a huge level of expertise and you're one of those uh, rare academics who has uh, an incredibly deep research expertise paired with extensive experience in this online environment. When you look at some of the research that you've done over the last, say, decade or so, and you, you focused on self-regulation and you focused on things like discourse analysis and learning strategies and so on, what kind of advice would you give someone, both as a researcher, as a teacher, that you would like them to know based on the research lens that you've developed? Well, I, I think I made a key point as we are going in and designing uh, courses or transitioning very urgently online is really not to underestimate the importance of interaction and that kind of interaction that is happening bet between uh, our learners, students and content instructors and other students. I think we probably are thinking these days just to kind of turn a lot of good content or as quickly as we can to that, but we really want to kind of pay attention carefully how we are guiding our students to basically use that content, how they are going to interact with that content. We should also basically not forget that when students are in that kind of online environment, they need a bit more guidance than usual. They usually don't have these kind of usual uh, social and other types of supports that they can find on the campus. So when they are online, they basically are required to have much stronger self-regulated learning skills. And so that's why basically kind of that scheduling very clear clarity of the steps is necessary for some learners. Doesn't mean for all the learners is essential, but I think for a significant number of learners who don't really have that kind of experience, it's really, really essential to establish that. There's another critical thing that many of us really, and even I was doing those mistakes when I was starting initially to teach some first online courses at Tabasco University is to kind of design carefully online interactions between students. So students really want to socialize when they are interacting in these, but you can't really just expect I created a discussion board and the discussion will kind of just miraculously happen there. You really kind of need to carefully discuss, uh, kind of create the tasks for learners that are requiring some level of cooperation. And you also want your learners to kind of start gradually building the community. And the favorite framework that I've been building upon is the, community, the framework of communities of inquiry that is uh, created by um, Randy Garrison and other colleagues from Canada. And basically kind of is really offering nice guidance about the importance of the teaching presence there, the way how you can scaffold these discussions and then eventually kind of have the students to go and discuss with you. Obviously, in these times of transition, and there's also a considerable amount of research done, is the extent to which you want to kind of have some of these things synchronously or asynchronously. I think that's really one of the kind of the key things. 
I mean, as much as you want to kind of do some of these things synchronously, and many of the colleagues will be using Zoom, like just George and I are using to record this conversation, which is proven in the literature to be as effective in terms of the learning outcomes as just a face-to-face -face interaction, uh, it may not necessarily lead to the same levels of satisfaction for your students. That's one thing. And the other more important thing is that might not really be flexible enough solution, especially in these times when you basically have students who are juggling their lives, they are trying to kind of uh, meet their basically maybe free slots to just buy some food in the time when they are allowed to go outside and everything, you need to kind of accom accommodate for that level of flexibility. So I think that's another thing that we really don't often pay so much attention when we are designing courses on campus is the level of flexibility that we want to have for our students. And the final point that I wanna say is basically think about feedback. Think about how you can provide that feedback. And I'd say there are two critical levels. If you're teaching a large, large class, you really can't multiply yourself to provide feedback for hundreds or thousands of students. But what you can do there is you can probably turn to two things. Think about peer review, not necessarily peer assessment, but peer review, and has benefits that is research showing, both in terms of basically students much deeper engaging with the content and the, uh, and the, and, and the type of information you want them to, to work on. And the other critical thing is there is that it is not those who are receiving feedback that are benefiting, but it's equally so those who are uh, providing feedback that are actually benefiting from that kind of interaction. That's one level. And the other level is really trying to use some of these uh, recent data uh, based or data-driven type of technologies that are providing feedback, the type of work Abelardo Pardo led on on task is something that can really offer great value for the students, especially in the times where they need kind of gradual nudge to basically better manage their time, to better self-regulate, or just simply meet up the expectations that you may have in your course designs. Those are uh, fantastic points of advice. And, and one of the things that uh, you, you touched on is the community of inquiry framework. And early on, because we wanted to, there's, there's a range of frameworks and range of models that people can use as they start doing online instruction or teaching at a distance. We select the community of inquiry model because it was, uh, it's a quick way to onboard and give people a framework that they can start to do practical work with. And I know you've had, several PhD students that have used the community of inquiry framework in some of their analysis. Do you want to talk a little bit about the research or the outputs that you've discovered uh, from using that a model in online instruction and what's most relevant to teachers who are getting started now? Yeah, I mean, we use it in many different levels and in many different uh, angles uh, of communities of inquiry. One key thing though, for me, if you are talking about the practice and translating of everything what we found in practice is really carefully crafting the scaffolds that you may have for your students to engage into the discussion. So for example, early in my teaching, I made kind of potentially some of the common mistakes that many of us want. We want basically our students to contribute set number of messages and you basically say, well, contribute X number of messages, but that's not enough. The quality of those discussions are not, not necessarily the best. What we basically observed was, yes, you can spend a lot of time facilitating those discussions as an instructor, but my kind of point was, well, you know, that's not scalable and that's not really going to uh, get you far along away. So there are two general type of scaffolds that I would recommend. The first one is co consider basically discussions where students may have different roles. So some students basically may be kind of the leads in particular discussions. So often I would kind of say, this person is kind of responsible to prepare some kind of topic and then act as an expert in particular discussions while other uh, students are more like practicing whatever the field of their kind of research practicing sociologists or practicing uh, computer scientists and so on. So, and then that basis is kind of the, and then rotating these roles is really important. The other critical thing is also to provide students with the kind of guidance, what is the quality of that message that you want them to submit? in these discussions. So what, where do you want them to kind of get with that kind of the conversation? So kind of make sure to provide some small kind of very simple bullet point list how or what entails to have a kind of a high quality contribution in these discussions. What we found basically is based on the experimentation with these type of messages is really that it is critical to provide these type of scaffolds and especially that we can track easily over time how students quality of discussion to put it uh, in that way or interaction or cognitive presence in more formal terms is really significantly increasing over time 
and more importantly, that is directly associated with the final student's grades as well as student satisfaction. Anecdotally as well, I can say that these type of scaffolds are really creating the community. So to me, it was basically really fascinating to see some of the students reaching out to me after a few weeks, recognizing that some of their peers are struggling in these discussions, asking how they can help. And to me, that kind of tells you that you set up a community of the learners who care for each other. One of them even said once, like, you know, I finally see my peers as, as real uh, uh, colleagues, or, and I felt this is like a real class. Yeah, that, that's a terrific point because we've, we've had, uh, I think, a fair bit of response from students early on. We had a student panel uh, you know, during the course uh, in, the, in the first startup week, and there was uh, really you know, something that impacted me a fair bit was one student said that she felt she did not know any of her teachers or any of her student peers after having taken a number of courses online in a program. And I thought that was actually disappointing to hear given how engaging things can be when you're involved in learning in online settings. Now, uh, the final question, I just want to talk a little bit about one of the areas of research that is central and I've heard you to, to really advancing in the digital spaces. And I've heard you talk about this in the past and you and I've had conversations on this, which is when there's a desire to add sort of more technology in online settings and there's been a focus on personalized learning and adaptive learning and the list goes on. And in many cases, that's not really the goal uh, when you're teaching online. The goal is to create learners who are capable of being adaptive, meaning, and this is your, your thinking that you know, you've talked about, is you don't want so much adaptive learning as you want adaptive learners. And that likely reflects a large part of your own focus, which is on things like goal orientation, study strategy, self-regulation, and so on. Can you talk more about what you mean when you talk about adaptive learners in online settings? Yeah, thanks, George. Thanks for bringing it up. Yeah, I've been talking for quite some time. I haven't really written much about that, if at all, about adaptive learners. Uh, uh, but the key point is basically want to remove decision making from our learners we want them to put them into the position to be able to make these decisions and to be able to make mistakes in that safe environment i think that's really the kind of the key point lots of these adaptive learning technologies are kind of removing the decision making uh, choices if you wish from the learners to put them on, onto the technology the key thing is for the learners really is to kind of over time realize what are those kind of high quality standards of good outcomes or good strategies to learn something. So when you, for example, want to write an essay, that you really kind of understand what does it mean to be a good quality, like in terms of that the kind of paragraphs are cohesive, that when you have like a thread of flow of your thoughts, is basically kind of going from one sentence to another sentence in all the paragraphs that key messages are circulated there. That's basically one level of it. The other level of it is basically when learners are trying to study something that they really kind of need to understand the importance of taking notes or importance of basically just kind of going and selecting and choosing the right type of information. That's basically something that you need to kind of provide in terms of uh, discussing with students what is relevant there. And this is why I'm actually emphasizing the kind of process of the formation of that adaptive learner creating scaffolded discussions and these cooperative opportunities for the learners where they can really kind of engage deeply into, into what is the high quality information, what is the high quality approach to study something, what is the high quality approach to kind of have a stoppage criteria, okay, this is good enough, don't overstudy, you master it enough, you can actually address a particular task in a certain situation. And obviously, I mean, this is much harder bit than that's basically kind of going into maybe some of the uh, socio-affective states or socio-emotional states in terms of basically when you basically are trying to solve something many times and you get so frustrated the question is how you reach out to others and to seek help that's really quite essential bit well great thanks very much for for that overview and introduction to your research i know you've made a big impact uh, for many people with uh with the kinds of insights that you've generated from the, the studies that you've run and, and the part that's always been impressive from my end is you've taken, uh, while you have a, obviously your background is computer science and the semantic web, you've made a strong shift in deeply understanding learning 
the social emotional aspects of learning and have made some significant contributions in that area. So I'm eager to share some of your literature and resources with the students in this course. So thanks again for, for taking the time to chat with us today. My pleasure, George, and best of luck with the course.